All right, well, good morning. Uh, we are starting a new series today called Inside Out. Here's kind of the premise. We're going to be doing this for about four weeks. Most of our life, we spend fixing ourselves from the outside in. We may not even think of it that way or realize it that way, but that's what we end up doing. We spend our entire life trying to improve ourselves outwardly. So if you don't feel good about yourself, what do you do a lot of times, especially ladies? You go shopping, right? And you try to you try to look good on the outside, like maybe a new outfit's going to make me feel all better. Or guys, maybe you know you're going through that midlife crisis. There's something internally happening in you. So what do you buy? A motorcycle, a car, <laughs> right? A convertible. You think if you do something outwardly, it's going to fix what's happening internally. Or maybe even you try to make an adjustment to your life where you're like, okay, I'm going to really work on who I am. And so we make these outward adjustments, these disciplines that we do. And, and essentially the strategy is, I'm going to fake it till I make it, right? I've, I've, I've got something internal inside of me and it's coming out as anger, so I'm going to take these steps and I'm going to do this and, and I'm going to change my behavior. And here's what happens. We change it for a little while, and then we end up, this is true, okay, it's okay to admit failure, we, we change our behavior for a while, and then we, admit, we have to admit that we end up being the same person we were before. That just happens. And we don't like that, and we don't want to admit it, but that's exactly who we are. And then we come to faith in God, and we start attending church, and we're like, okay, I'm going to follow God, and God's going to give me the thing that I am looking for. And so we, we start to follow God, and but you know what? We do the same thing. We do it outwardly, hoping it's going to change something inwardly. And so we start following God, and we're like, okay, well, we'll obey God's rules, and God wants me to do good things and not bad things, and, and he wants me to go to a church, and he wants me to do this and that. And so we try to follow after God, but it doesn't seem like anything changes. I made three significant attempts to put my faith in Christ before I actually put my faith in Christ. And, and I would guess that there's quite a few of you out in the audience that have probably done this before in the past, or maybe you're there right now, where you've attempted to put your faith in Christ. And you've attempted and you've attempted, and really what you're trying to do is you're trying to be changed from the outside. You're trying to do it under your own power. You're trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. But that's not what God wants. God wants to transform you from the inside out. And here's how he does this. He gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. I want to talk about the Spirit. Jesus uh, is talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is one of those passages of Scripture that is iconic. You might recognize the little verse called John 3.16, right? Before he gets to John 3.16, he's talking to Nicodemus, and he turns to Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus I mean, it sounds like a really dumb question, but this is the question we would have had at the time. Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, well, how can you get inside your mother's womb again? That won't work. That's a good, honest question. Uh, Jesus, it doesn't say Jesus snickered. Jesus just responded. This is what he said. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of Water. Now, let's talk about that for a second. Some people read a lot into that. Some people are like, well, he's talking about baptism here. You've got to be born of the water, right? That's what. No, that, that's not what he's talking about. I, I think in a minute you'll see in the context, he's, he's making a reference to the ambiotic fluid that all of us were in at one point in our life. All of us were in a sack of water at one point, and we came out of that. He's talking about our earthly birth. He is talking about our outward birth. You and I were all born of water. And so he turns to Nicodemus and he says, not only should you be born of the water, but then he introduces a revolutionary concept. And he says, you should be born of the water and the Spirit. You should be born of the water and the Spirit. Now the, the water, the, the, the fleshly birth, is very outwardly, right? You can see that. You can tell if somebody's been born or not. Anybody know anybody that's not been born, right? You can tell when somebody's been... It's, it's outward. You can see it. Now, but the Spirit, the birth of this Spirit is very internal. That word Spirit is the word pneuma, right? Simply means air. Any guys in here have tools? You know what a pneumatic tool is, right? 
For those of you who don't know, the pneumatic tools are the ones in the shop that go, woo, woo, you know, like that. That's a pneumatic tool. Why? Because the root word is pneuma. It is a, it is a tool run on air, right? That's, that is what this is. All He says, you must be born of the water and you must be born of the spirit or air or wind or breath. And throughout the New Testament, it is built on this cornerstone idea. And this is a game changer. You have to understand this. That God doesn't want you to change your outward behavior. God doesn't want you to practice a different moral code than the one you've been practicing before. God wants you to be born. He wants you to be regenerated by His Spirit. And this is how God transforms us from the inside out. And I want to tell you, there's a lot of very religious people who believe in God, who maybe even attend church on a regular basis, who have never been born of the Spirit. God wants to transform you from the inside out. He goes on to explain it in the next verse. He says, flesh, flesh gives birth to flesh, right? Humans give birth to humans. That's just how it works. But the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. This is something that happens internally by the power of God. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now, He's going to give the, the, the key ingredient to the Spirit here. And, and I just want you to hear it. I, I had to give you this verse today before we started this series. Because this is like the first rule of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like the first rule of Fight Club. Everybody knows the first rule of Fight Club is what? You don't talk about Fight Club. Some people are like, what are you talking about? Anyway, the first rule of the Holy Spirit is you can't always tell what the Holy Spirit's going to do. That's, that's the first rule of the Holy Spirit. Here's what Jesus says. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. Y- you hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. But here's what we do. We try to, try to box in the Spirit. We try, to, we try to make the Spirit do the things we want to do. We've seen the Spirit of God move in our lives in the past, and so we try to recreate that. And God comes along and He reminds us, listen, the, the Spirit, it's hard to put your finger on. It's hard to box in. It's hard to explain. But the Spirit of God moves where He wants to move. And through this series, all we want to do is we want to come and say, the Spirit of God is real. It's not an it, it's a He. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to you and me. And you cannot be a follower of Jesus. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven without being born of the Spirit. And the Spirit's going to do what the Spirit wants to do. But you and I, here's what we got to do. We just got to let the Holy Spirit move in our life. And without that move in our life, we will not be able to see any kind of change. We will not be able to follow God. We will not do what God wants to do in our life. He wants to regenerate us from the inside out. And if you're like me, maybe you you came to church or you tried to follow the religious practice. I remember um, when I was first attempting to follow God, I I had to give money. I had a job and I was like, okay, I got to give money because God wants me to give money. It's almost like I was paying. I remember one week I couldn't make it to church. But I was like, but, and I, so I gave my brother money because I had a hang, hangover. I said, here, take my money and give it to church because I thought that's what God wanted from me, right? But God, God wants so much more than just your money. He wants your very life. He wants to change you from the inside out. Don't, don't follow just a list of religious practices. Don't follow a moral code. Here's what you need to do. You need to surrender your life completely so that the Spirit of God can transform you from the inside out. So today, I'm going to start with one particular aspect as I describe the Holy Spirit. And again, this is, this is a tough task because you don't always know how the Spirit's going to work. It's a tough task sometimes. But I'm going to start describing how the Holy Spirit works. Let me start by saying this. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling, right? When we start talking about this Holy Spirit, all of a sudden we get, we get a little feely and we get a little bit weird. And honestly, the churches that seem to talk about the Holy Spirit the most are cuckoo churches, right? If you, has anybody ever been to a cuckoo church? I, I think it's okay to say that if you're talking about like really cuckoo. 
I, I went to like what I would say was hands down a, a cuckoo church, and I believe what they were doing is they were chasing a feeling. So I went to this church one time, and there was a lot of activity happening in the audience, and the, and the, the worship leader was up there really trying to spur on the activity. And I swear to you, a woman uh, beside me and behind me one row started to cluck like a chicken. And I don't mean it just like she was making a noise like a chicken. I mean she was going, <laughs> honestly, right there in church. And I was like, why is that happening? Right? I mean, you can do whatever you want, right? This was, this was actually in Oklahoma. It wasn't even in Taylor, Michigan. But anyway, we... I was just like, why? why? Why does that need to happen, right? Like, how is the Holy Spirit, how is anybody benefiting from that? And usually what it comes down to is sometimes people are so pursuing this, this feeling, man, I want to feel, I want to experience, I want to do it, that sometimes we actually conjure it on our own, right? It's not actually a movement of God, it's just a feeling that we are experiencing. And I need you to know, if you've ever kind of been afraid of the Holy Spirit or afraid of churches that talk about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost or anything, I want you to know, the Holy Spirit is, is mystical. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit is real. But the Holy Spirit isn't cuckoo. It has a purpose. And in fact, today, what I want to talk about is actually what the Holy Spirit wants to do is transform our understanding, it wants to transform our mind, it wants us to, to think differently. Not act weird, but think differently. Now, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is one of these few places in Scripture where it kind of describes how the Holy Spirit works. You don't get a lot of these in the New Testament. Well, a lot of times you'll be like, well, the Spirit did this, or the Spirit did that, or the Spirit spoke through somebody, or the Spirit empowered somebody to do this. You get a lot of that, but Paul actually kind of breaks it down, and he says, here's how the Spirit works. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 goes like this. We do, however, this is Paul and kind of his entourage. He had a group of people that he went from town to town, city to city, talked about the gospel. He's talking about we. He says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. What's he talking about? He's talking about the mature in Christ. We speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age. Keep that in mind. Not the wisdom of this age. That's important. Or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Now let's talk about that for a second. The rulers of this age or the wisdom of this age. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about his first century context. He's talking about the world he lives in. The rulers he uh, has that are rulers in power at the time. He's talking about the people of influence back then. You and I also live in an age and your grandparents lived in an age, and people every generation live in an age. You and I live in an age, and, and let me try to describe what our age is like. Our age has this sort of collective wisdom that we live with right now. And it is influenced by a lot of things. It's, it's influenced by the rulers of this age, right? I mean, what are the more two in, more influential people over the last 10 years? Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Right? That doesn't mean they're on the same page, right? Can't think of two presidents that have been less on the same page. That doesn't mean they're on the same page. They're very, very different. There's a big contrast between the two. But they present the extreme ends of sort of the, the wisdom of our age. But it's not just them. It's, it's everybody that has influence. Everybody from <coughs> elected officials, everybody who's a celebrity and has influence, everybody from Oprah to Harry Styles right? That's who is giving this input into the wisdom of our age. And so right now in our culture, in our world, we have a wisdom. And people are trying to, trying to figure it out like crazy, right? They're trying to figure out truth. They're trying to discover like what's right and what's wrong. And there is a wisdom of this age. Now, Sometimes the wisdom of the age brings about really good things. Like 200 years ago, slavery was just sort of normal. It may not have been normal for everybody, 
But it was at least accepted. It was legalized. It was, it was something that happened. In our age, not only would it cannot be considered normal or appropriate, it's considered by the wisdom of our age evil, as it should be, right? On the other hand, 200 years ago, or in our current day, we legalize strip clubs and pornography, and it's accepted, and it's considered normal. You go back 200 years ago, they would have never looked at the sexual exploitation of girls for money as appropriate or acceptable. If you were to take a video of pornography that we have today, you were to go in a time machine 200 years ago and showed it to anybody, they would have been like, no, this is not, this is not good. We don't want to watch two people have sex, right? But in our culture, it's just, it's just life. And so you might think, oh, we're getting worse. Or maybe you're thinking, oh, we're getting better. And I want you to tell you, no, we're just going in a big cycle. And it's a big circle, and it'll continue to go for the rest of eternity. And we will never, ever, on this earth, be able to figure it out. That is the wisdom of this age. Now, Paul says, the wisdom of their age, they didn't have wisdom back then either. They had Augustus, and they had Claudius, and they had... Nero, and these are the people that are shaping their culture. They had the Stoic philosophers. Uh, they had the Jewish leaders. They had Annas and Caiaphas and, and the religious leaders that actually crucified Jesus. That was the wisdom of their age. And Paul says, man, they couldn't figure it out. It didn't make sense to the rulers of the wisdom and their wisdom of that age. So the next verse. Talking about this wisdom, he says, now, we declare God's wisdom. Just hear that. God's wisdom will not be found in the wisdom of this age. God's wisdom cannot be discovered through Barack Obama or Donald Trump or Oprah, Harry Styles, or anybody in between. God's wisdom comes from somewhere else. And Paul says, in our day, it didn't come from Annas or Caiaphas or Augustus or Claudius or Nero. It didn't come from the wisdom of this age. It didn't come from culture. It came from God. And so he begins to describe a wisdom from God. Now, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden. It it didn't mean that like we found it or Paul discovered it. It says it has been hidden. It has been kept from people. But it has been revealed to who? Those of us who have done exactly what Jesus said, who have been born of the Spirit. People who have put their faith in Christ, who have yielded their life to Christ and accepted God. Because of that, God gives us His Spirit and He reveals it to us. A mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. God's greatest gift that he gives you from the inside out in your spirit is an understanding, the mysteries of the universe. I tell you what, there's a, there's a lot of mysteries that people have, it, and the, it, it boggles their mind. Well, how could God create a world like this, and there's so much struggling, there's so much pain, and that actually isn't a very difficult question. It, it, it sucks to experience but why there's so much pain and suffering in this world? If you've got the Spirit of God, that's, that's not a difficult question. It's pretty easy. Because God wants to add, get everybody to eternal life. That's His objective, right? That's what the Spirit reveals to us, that it isn't about goodness in this world. It's about taking us out of this world and, and getting us to eternal life. That's the wisdom of God. It's been hidden except for people who have the Spirit of God. Again, it says, none of the rulers of this age understood it back then or now. For if they had, (laughs) they wouldn't have done this. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right? They would have, oh, this is God's Son. Man, the Spirit has revealed to me that this is God's Son. Maybe we shouldn't kill Him. Right? Right? He says, no, they didn't get it because it was hidden from them. However, as it is written, check this out, it is written in the book of Isaiah, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. 
Now check this out. How many of y'all have ever heard that read at a funeral? I've read it as a, at a funeral. I, it seems like it's talking about like heaven and stuff, doesn't it? What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, I can only imagine, right? That's, that's the song, right? That, that was me singing. I don't know if you could pick that up. And what no human mind has conceived, the things that God prepared for. So, so we imagine all the stuff that God's got for us in heaven because, oh, man, God's ways are so much higher than our ways. And there's, there's no way that we could possibly understand what's going on inside of the mind of God. But that's not what it says. Listen, this is what it says. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Next verse. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. These are the things that God has revealed to us by His Spirit. God has taken His Spirit, He's placed it inside of you so that you can understand things that none of the rulers of this age, none of the people in this world will ever understand. God has showed us His grand design and His grand plan, and He has done this by the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you if you've put your faith in Christ. Well, he's going to break this down. He's going to show us how this works. I love this. The Spirit, next verse, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought, thoughts except their own spirit within them? Right? You're, you're sitting out there today and you're looking at the screen or you're looking at me and you're, you're thinking about what I'm saying, right? Maybe. Or maybe you're thinking about something else completely, right? How did you know? Because I have ADD, right? You might, you might be thinking about something, but nobody would ever know, right? From the outside looking in, you're the only one that knows. You might be having really wonderful thoughts, right? Maybe you've bounced off of this and you're, you're in some wonderful world where you're imagining all the things that God's going to reveal to you by, your, by His Spirit and you're in a really good place. Or you might be thinking about some really horrible things and about how you're going to kill the person in front of you, right? You, it, who knows? Except you. You, you know. I, we cannot know what's happening inside another human being. Husbands, you know that's true, right? Look at your wife. Like you, you've been married to her for how long? And you have no idea what she's thinking, right? Ladies, same way, I'm sure. It's a little less complicated, but you don't know the... You don't know the... I've been married for this year. It'll be 21 years, and I, I know my... Yeah, yeah. I have... Uh, I have known my wife. There's nobody I'm closer to. There's nobody that I understand more in this world, but I can't tell you what's happening inside of her spirit. The spirit that resides inside of a person, only they know. God is the same way. It says this, In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. God's spirit inside of him knows what he is thinking. And here's what's beautiful. I would love it if we got married and like I could know her thoughts and she could know mine. And Well, maybe that wouldn't be a good idea. But anyway, it would, it would make communication easier. But that's not what happens. But when we put our faith in Christ, God takes his very own spirit that resides inside of him that searches all things and he places it inside of us so that we can know. We can know the mysteries of the universe. Next verse, it says, What? What we have received is not the spirit of the world, or the wisdom of the world, or the wisdom of this age, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak. Again, this is Paul talking in his entourage here. He says, this is what we speak. Next verse. This is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. Spirit realities with Spirit-taught words. Now, if you're a thinker, and I'm hoping that's the case in here, you can spend some time thinking about that. What, what exactly does that mean? Spirit-taught 
words. A lot of people kind of think this means like speaking in tongues from one person to another. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about the Spirit of God that resides, resides inside of God is the Spirit that resolves inside of you. Let me, let me ask you a question. When you think of something, how do you hear that voice? Right? When you wake up in the morning and you're like, I'm not going to have a donut when I get to church today. I'm not going to have a donut when I get to church today. I'm not going to have, like, and then you get to church and you're like, yeah, I'll have one donut. I'll get to, that's, that's my inward voice, right? Yeah, maybe just one, right? And then after you eat the donut, you're like, why did you do that? You're so fat and stupid. That's my inward voice, okay? Maybe not yours. Um, that inward voice that's happening inside of you, how did you hear that? Did you hear it through an audible voice? No, it was the, it was the spirit that resides inside of you. When God comes and regenerates us and gives us new birth by His Holy Spirit, He now lives inside of you. The question I get asked over and over again is, why don't we hear an audible voice like they did in the Old Testament? Why doesn't God show up and why doesn't He speak from the heavens? Why doesn't He thunder? And I'm like, because we have so much, something so much better than that. We have God's Spirit that resides inside of us. We can actually think the thoughts of God. These are the spiritual taught words that he's talking about. Now, if you're confused, the next verse will explain why. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. So you just don't have the Spirit of God, so you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Easy. Um, no, this is, this is important. He says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. When I was a, when I was a new believer, I was a young guy, I, I remember what it was like to not have the Spirit of God. I remember that it, before I had the Spirit of God, I wasn't confused. I, I thought I had it all figured out. I didn't feel like there was some kind of veil over my eyes. I, I felt like I understood what was going on in the world, and I had a sense of right, and I had a sense of wrong, and it's just the way the world was. I didn't feel confused. But eventually through a process, I, I had to admit that God was real and I was accountable to him and I needed to figure that out. And so one day after a long process and many attempts, I finally fully and completely resolved to re surrender my life to God. Not everybody has this experience, but in that moment when I finally did that, I remember I was sitting in my truck in Carlsbad, New Mexico. I only lived there for nine months, but I was there in Carlsbad, New Mexico, in my truck next to the Pecos River. And I gave my life to Christ. And I immediately knew what I needed to do with my life. The world around me immediately began to make sense. It was like I was finally unplugged from the matrix. If you're over the age of 30 in here. If you... It was like I was finally unplugged from the... It's like I could finally understand. I could see things a whole lot. I don't remember in that time and in that place feeling like I was, I was stupid, but I remember when I, when I got the Spirit of God, I could understand not just my life, but I could understand the grander scheme of life. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And so I got all excited about it, right? And I'm going to go save everybody that I care about. There's like three people, but I went and I was like... I'm, <laughs> You know, save all those people. So I went to those people and I was like, yeah. I tried to explain them. I tell them my story. I'd be like, here's, here's what God did inside of me and here's how the world works and here's the gospel. Have you heard the gospel? Do you know what that is? And I would make these attempts and they would just look at me like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a religious person. Did, what, at what point did I say, come be a religious person? I didn't say that. I talked about God. I talked about Jesus, what he did on the cross, eternal life, right? I'm trying to explain it. And they, they, they're just looking at me like I'm explaining two plus two, but they don't understand how it equals four. And so I, I'm trying it again. I'm like, okay, well, let me go at it from this approach. And finally, I realized there was no way for me to explain it in a way they could understand because a person without the Spirit they can't even get it. They can't even understand it. And until they, until they surrender their life to God, like just like I did, until they yield and say, man, I'm accountable to somebody and I believe God's real, and, and they surrender their life to God and they receive the Spirit of God, they, they can't understand it. So if you've got a family member 
If you've got a kid, if you've got a teenager especially, they don't get the spirit until they're like much older. I'm just kidding. I don't know when. It just kind of depends on the kid, right? But man, if, if you've been trying to explain truth and you just don't understand, why don't they? Why don't they understand? It's because only the people, the Spirit of God residing in them can understand it. The next verse. He says, the, the person without the Spirit makes ju- with the Spirit makes judgment about all things. I'm not just talking about understanding the gospel. I'm talking about making judgments about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? That's a key verse in the Old Testament. Man, who's known the mind of the Lord? Who can instruct God? Who can tell God what's going on? Because only God knows what's going on. But then he tells us what happened. He says this, but we have the mind of Christ. Today, if you've put your faith in Him, if you're following Him, He has given you this gift and it transforms you from the inside out. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you view the world. If you haven't experienced that kind of transformation, if it kind of feels like you're going to church and you're just like, you know, this kind of makes sense, but this doesn't really make sense. And it just says like, it's just, yeah, I don't even know. If you view like your faith as being a religious person, then my guess is you probably don't have the Holy Spirit. Because when, when you understand what Christ has revealed to us, to mankind, it changes the way you view Everything. Not just, not just church, not just God, not just Jesus, but it changes the way you view your relationship. It changes the, the, the mission you have in life. When you yield your life and God's very own Spirit transform you and you now have the mind of Christ, you are different. Now, I'll be honest with you if, you. if you're sitting out there and you're going, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if that's what i got going on then it's as simple as this. Just surrender your life. See, God can't can't teach you anything as long as you know everything. Right? God God can't reveal to you anything if you don't need any revealing to. Like if you've got it all figured out and you know everything about everything, then God can't show you anything. But if today, right here in this place, I don't care if you've been going to church your whole life or this is your very first Sunday. See, that's the beauty about it. This could be your first time ever in a church building. But if you come to God and you say, God, I want you to reveal to me. I want you to give me your spirit. I want you to regenerate my mind. I yield my life to you and I welcome you into my heart and my life. God will change the way you think about everything. Right now, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I want you to be able to pray along with me. Maybe, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. We never stop yielding to the Holy Spirit, right? Maybe, again, this is your first Sunday in here. I want you to be able to just receive what I'm about to say and hear from the Holy Spirit. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray that you would transform the minds of everyone listening to this, everybody in the room, everybody online, God, anybody that that is interested in knowing You, I pray that every person listening would yield their life to You. That they would surrender fully and completely. They would acknowledge that they, they know nothing and they have nothing and all they need is You. God, as we humble ourselves before us, God, I pray that You would transform our minds. God, would you, would you give birth to the Spirit inside of every person that's come here today? Regenerate us, God. Not, not just outward religious practices, but God, transform us from the inside out. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen.